Good afternoon, everybody. So on Tuesday and Wednesday, the Federal Open Market Committee, the policy setting group at the Federal Reserve, uh, had a two-day policy meeting. And at the end of that meeting yesterday, they issued a statement about their changes to their monetary policy. Can anybody tell me what those changes were? Anybody know? Anybody know who the Federal Reserve is? <laughs> Chairman of the Federal Reserve? Where the Federal Reserve is located? Yes. What they did? What did they do? Well, yeah. Yeah, but that's not a change in monetary policy. She would like to have more saving in the economy. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that they indicated is that short-term interest rates, the interest rate that the Federal Reserve uh, uh, controls, will stay at a low level of 0 to 25 basis points for a, quote, considerable length of time, unquote. Okay. And by the way, is the same statement they made at the previous meeting, in the previous meeting, in the previous meeting, in the previous meeting, in the previous meeting. Before that, they didn't use the word considerable. They used a long period of time. So what that suggests then is that the very low interest rates that we see today are likely to stay in place for a considerable period of time, which most people think to mean through the first half of next year. Did they do anything else? Well, you can't really know much about macro unless you know something about Federal Reserves and central bank policy. So the other thing that the Federal Reserve did was to reduce the amount of asset purchases that they're making by $10 billion. So this is what is popularly known in the press as quantitative easing. So at a peak, the Federal Reserve was buying $85 billion of assets uh, per month. They are now down to $15 billion per month. And after next month's meeting, they'll probably be at zero. So while the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, the amount of assets that the Federal Reserve actually has in their balance sheet, is continuing to grow, since March it's been growing at a slower and slower pace. They do not anticipate actually bringing the balance sheet lower, but leaving it at a very high level. Now, you may or may not remember we had a chart that looked at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet way back on day one, and I pointed out to you that before the economic crisis hit in 2008, the balance sheet was $800 billion. Today, it is $4.3 trillion, which is a big, big change. We'll talk more about quantitative easing, why they do those kinds of things, what the implications were uh, a bit later, and why people either agree or disagree with the Federal Reserve actually having done so. Today, however, we want to continue our discussion of the solo growth model. So in the solo model, you may recall that we have basically three functions, a per-worker production function, a per-worker investment or saving function, as well as a per-worker balance investment function. And we put those three together in a diagram, and we made the simplifying assumption that productivity, total factor productivity, was not changing. So whatever level we're at, that's the level that we're at. We'll see later today what happens if we change that level of total factor productivity. We also pointed out last time that we have four exogenous variables in the solo model. Right? And we should be able to see all of those. We have total factor productivity in two different places. We have the depreciation rate, the labor force growth rate, and we have the national saving rate. So those are the exogenous variables in our model. Now, as we discussed at the end on Tuesday, when an exogenous variable change changes, one, of the, one or more of the functions will also change. We'll get a shift, we'll get a rotation, we'll get something. And that means then we will have a new equilibrium point. And equilibrium points in the solo model are referred to as steady states. So notice here that at point S, we have a capital to labor ratio. And at this point, actual investment is exactly equal to balanced investment. When actual investment equals balanced investment, there's no reason for the capital to labor ratio to change. So we're at this capital to labor ratio sub S, and it's going to stay there. So remember what balanced investment tells us, how much actual investment is necessary to keep the capital to labor ratio constant. So if we're actually investing the amount that's necessary to keep the capital to labor ratio constant, the capital to labor ratio will stay constant. Now, when that is the case, we can also go up to our production function, and we can see that income per worker that's being generated in the economy. If the capital to labor ratio is not changing, then neither will income per worker. So this is what we mean by the steady state, a situation in which the capital to labor ratio does not change, in which case with no productivity adjustment, there would also be no change in economic output or income per person. So now we're at that steady state. But again, what we want to think about is what happens if we're not at the steady state? Right? What happens if we're not at the steady state? This is something that we refer to as disequilibrium dynamics. Disequilibrium, of course, means we're not in equilibrium. And dynamics suggests that there is some process that will take place to get us back to equilibrium. So as an initial assumption, let's suppose that we have a capital to labor ratio that is below our steady state level. And what we want to think about is that there is a sudden, substantial, substantial, oh, let's try that again. A sudden substantial change in either the capital stock, which would decline, or the labor force would increase. Now, when we talk about sudden substantial changes, we're talking about something large that takes place in a very short period of time, say a year or maybe two years. Remember, the solo growth model is a long-term model. We're trying to explain average annual growth rates over periods of time of a decade or longer. Right? So this is something that's happening very, very quickly. So a couple of things that might happen here that bring this about. Right? A sudden substantial decline in the capital stock. Right? How about a big earthquake? Right? Which would knock down a whole bunch of buildings, destroy some of the capital stock. Might kill a few people, but we'll assume the change in the capital stock is much larger. Okay? So that would reduce the capital to labor ratio. We've had a number of those all over the world in recent years. 
Another alternative, though, to drop the capital to labor ratio would be a sudden substantial increase in the labor force. Now, these don't happen nearly as often, but you might have a situation in which there was a substantial immigration into a country of working age adults. So we've had situations in the past where the U.S. government said to Cuba, for instance, in the, I think it was around 1980, um, if you want to let people out of Cuba to come to the United States, we'll take them. 200, 250,000 Cubans left and all arrived in South Florida. Now, two or 250,000 people in the population of the United States doesn't really change our capital to labor ratio very much. But having all those people arrive in South Florida changes the capital to labor ratio in that region. So we would see a big drop in the capital to labor ratio as those immigrants arrive. Or we might think about the time that as the Soviet Union was breaking up and Russia decided to relax its emigration policies and a million Russians left to go to Israel. Now, a million people leaving Russia probably doesn't change the capital to labor ratio much in Russia, but a million people arriving in Israel changed that capital to labor ratio quite significantly. So there's a couple of examples that, where this might have occurred. So let's see if we can figure out what that means in terms of our model. So here, what we're talking about is some big event that pushes the capital to labor ratio below our steady state. Now, notice that I'm using a subscript 1 rather than a letter because I don't want you to be confused about this being a steady state capital to labor ratio. So when that capital to labor ratio falls, there are several consequences of that. The first is, if each worker has less capital to work with, there will also be a decline in income per worker. We've seen a sharp move back, right, back along our production function. At the same time, because income is lower, even though the saving rate has stayed the same, our level of actual saving and investment has declined. And we can also see, then, to maintain this lower capital to labor ratio, if we want to keep it here, not saying we do, but if we wanted to keep it there, we can come up to our balanced investment line and see how much investment would be necessary to keep the capital to labor ratio at that low level. Notice in this case that balanced investment declines more than actual investment does. The reason for this is that the production function exhibits diminishing marginal product of capital. So as the capital stock falls, income falls, but not by as much. And because income fall, doesn't fall as much, saving does, and therefore actual investment doesn't fall as much. But balanced investment is proportional to changes in the capital to labor ratio. This also shows us what's going to happen next. Let's look at this difference here. So at this point, we can see that actual investment per worker is greater than balanced investment per worker. And what do you think the implication of that is for the capital to labor ratio? So remember, balanced investment tells us how much is necessary to keep the capital to labor ratio constant. But we're actually investing more than that. So in that case, the capital stock should be rising relative to the labor force. So whenever actual investment exceeds balanced investment, the capital to labor ratio will rise. So now the capital to labor ratio starts to come back. As the capital to labor ratio starts increasing, income per worker will rise along the production function, saving and investment per worker will rise along our saving and investment per worker function, and a larger capital stock will also require higher balanced investment. So we move back along all three of our functions. But notice, everywhere, everywhere to the left of our steady state point S, actual investment is greater than balanced investment. So as long as the economy is to the left of its steady state or below its steady state, the capital to labor ratio will be rising. So over a relatively long period of time, the economy will now begin to recover. And as it recovers, we're recovering back to our initial steady state. So what this shows then is if the economy starts in the steady state, gets knocked down below its steady state, there's a natural economic rhythm between actual investment and balanced investment, which is going to drive increases in the capital to labor ratio, which is going to cause income per worker to rise. And that process continues until we get back to the original steady state. Now, two things about this particular adjustment process. One is how long it takes depends upon how far below the steady state we are. If you're way below the steady state, it's going to take a long time, up to 30 or 40 years. Obviously, if you're only a little bit below it, you could get back to it more quickly. Now, the second thing to notice as well, the further away you are from the steady state, the further below the steady state you are, the initial growth rate of the economy will be faster here as we recover than it will in the middle, which will be faster than as we get closer and closer to the steady state. Okay? Now, there's an easy way to actually see that. The first thing we want to ask ourselves is how fast was the economy growing in our initial steady state S, right, before, the, before this big sudden event? How fast was the economy growing? Not zero. Income per worker was not changing, which means that economic output was growing just as fast as the labor force. Right? A numerator, economic output, has to grow just as fast as the denominator, the labor force, when we're in the steady state. Okay? So we know how fast we're growing at the steady state. Let's think about the, what we call the transition period, the period of time it takes to get from KL sub 1 back to our steady state. What you can see is that income per worker is rising. Now remember, it rises over a number of years. Because the production function has diminishing marginal product of capital, the initial increments to the capital stock give us a big increase in economic output. Add another increment of capital of the same size, output rises, but by a smaller amount. 
Add a third increment of capital of the same size, economic output rises, but again, by a smaller amount. It all has to do with diminishing marginal product of capital. So the increase in income per worker will be relatively large at the beginning of the adjustment process and get progressively slower as we approach the steady state. When we often talk about the Japanese economic miracle of 1960 to 1990, or the German economic miracle of 1960 to 1990, the miracle is easily explained by this solo diagram. In both cases, Japan and Germany suffered significant damage to their capital stock in World War II. It's also true they suffered significant casualties to their labor force. Lots of soldiers and civilians were killed. But the percentage change on the capital stock was substantially larger in both Germany and Japan than was the case for the labor force. So in both cases, if we were to look at those countries in 1950, we would have seen that their capital to labor ratios were substantially below their steady state levels. So what would we expect? Both countries should grow very rapidly in the 1960s. They should continue to grow quickly in the 1970s, but not quite as fast as in the 60s. And then in the 80s, they should probably continue to grow fairly quickly, but again, not as fast as they did in the 1970s or in the 1960s. And that's exactly what we saw. In both cases, the economic growth was being driven by a rebuilding of the economy. Lots of investment to rebuild the capital stock, which drives rapid economic growth, until you get back to a steady state capital to labor ratio. Okay, so there's the adjustment process. Now, let's take a, a second example, thinking about the other side. A sudden substantial change in one, the capital stock here would have to increase or the labor force would have to decrease for the capital to labor ratio to jump above its steady state level. Now, it's very difficult to find examples where the capital stock suddenly increased. Most of the time, the capital stock is growing because we're undertaking investment that's greater than our depreciation. And it turns out that in most countries, the capital stock is very large relative to the new investment that's taking place. So the changes in the capital stock take place generally fairly slowly. So, but what we mean here is somehow you've got to have a whole bunch of new capital that you didn't have before. The only examples I've ever been able to find is during wartime periods when the invading army goes into a country, defeats the enemy, packs up all their factories, and sends them back to their home country. It happens. Again, not very many examples of that, but it does happen. It's much more likely when we find ourselves in this situation that there is some sudden substantial decline in the labor force. So this could happen because of emigration, right? just the opposite of what we talked before. If immigrants are coming into a country, they must be leaving another country, so that would be one way to see that. Alternatively, we could have some sort of pandemic. Remember in the video we saw last time, he talked about the catastrophe of World War I and uh, the Spanish flu epidemic. 54, 55 million people were killed by that all over the world, but primarily in Europe. So if we were looking at countries, we might see a sharp decline in the labor force. And in fact, World War I gives us two good examples of this. Both the UK had substantial declines in their labor force during World War I. Lots of their soldiers were killed or maimed. Very little happened to their capital stock because the United Kingdom was not involved uh, in the fighting, I mean, the land of, uh, on land uh, in Great Britain. France found themselves in a similar position. Most of the fighting took place in France and in Belgium. Lots of French soldiers died, much more so in that era than in World War II, not as much capital stock. So though it's possible then for the labor force to decline substantially. Okay. So let's think about what that would mean. Now all of a sudden, we've got a sudden change in the capital to labor ratio. It begins to bounce up. We need some period of adjustment in the economy to reallocate the capital to the remaining workers. But now each worker has more capital to work with, so they should be able to produce more. So income per worker will also increase. Notice this is simply a movement up along our per worker production function. Now as the capital to labor ratio rises, it's also a movement up along our balanced investment line. We would need a lot more actual investment in order to keep the capital to labor ratio at this level. So if we also see a small increase in actual investment, a movement up along the saving, fun saving and investment function, but notice what happens here. When we look at this difference, and this is the key difference we want to be looking at, actual investment per worker is less than balanced investment per worker. So if we're actually investing less than is necessary to keep the capital to labor ratio constant at K L sub 1, then the capital to labor ratio will begin to decline. In which case, in which case the capital to labor ratio starts a slow retreat 